for joining me tonight. Uh, we will be hearing from Amanda Hill. The webinar tonight is called Engaging the Community Within the Archives, the Land that Supports Our Feet Symposium by Deseronto Archives. Uh, during this webinar, archivist Amanda Hill will discuss the community event organized by the Des Deseronto Archives, which was shortlisted for the 2014 Governor General's History Award for the community programming. I will take a quick minute to introduce myself and my organization. My name is Jessica Knapp, and I am the Online Engagement Coordinator here at Canada's History Society. And if you're not familiar with Canada's History Society, we are a national charitable organization dedicated to making Canadian history popular for a general audience. And we do this in a number of ways, including our flagship publications, Canada's History Magazine, and Kayak, Canada's History Magazine for Kids. We also administer the Governor General History Awards, which recognize excellence in history in five different categories. I have provided links here to the list of 2014 Governor General's History Award for Community Programming recipients, as well as the link to the Government of Canada History Awards. Feel free to click on those links in the slideshow now, um, and you can explore them a little bit later. Amanda has prepared a presentation for us, so she will go through that, and then we will have the opportunity for questions towards the end. Uh, everything tonight should take about an hour, um, so if you need to take care of something, do it now quickly, um, and you can always come and go as you please tonight. Uh, the webinar is being recorded, so you can also reach it at a later time. Uh, if you have any questions during the presentation, feel free to ask them during during the presentation and by using the chat bar and window that we have already started using in the bottom right hand corner. I will help facilitate the questions towards the end, keeping track of them while Amanda is speaking and make sure they all get asked. Amanda has also prepared a collection of additional resources for this webinar that can be accessed through the first link on the slide that you see now. If you are on social media, please spread the word about our web our conversation tonight. I have included Canada's History Twitter handle and Facebook link on the slide, so go ahead and tweet at us. If you have questions or you uh, just want to promote that you're at a webinar tonight, go for it. We definitely recommend that. Um, we will be posting the recording afterwards, like I mentioned, and we will we really appreciate your feedback on this webinar, whether you're watching it live or as a recording at at some point in the future. There is a survey on our website that I will email out to all of those who have registered. If you have not registered, feel free to do so now, um, just so I have your email on file. That would be great. Uh, so this is Canada's History's last webinar in 2014, but we are starting a new theme in 2015, and that is focusing on historical venues. So if you want to check more out about that, or if you want to submit an idea, please check out the upcoming webinars on our website. Uh, or you can send me an email that you can see on the link here, or that you've, you've received an email from me earlier, so feel free to respond to those. Um, Amanda Hill, so a little bit about Amanda Hill. Um, she is an archi archival consultant for Hillbraith Limited. In this role, she currently manages the Archives Service of the Town of Desiranto and the Archives Association of Ontario's Archeon Network. Until 2007, she lived in England where she worked as an archivist at Canterbury Cathedral Archives, the Essex Record Office, and the Universities of Oxford and Manchester. And at this time, I'm actually going to hand everything over to Amanda and I will switch over to her slideshow while she introduces what she's going to be talking about tonight. Okay, can everyone hear me okay? So this evening, I'd like to um, talk about an event that we organized in 2013, um, just over a year ago now, um, where we were using archival materials as the basis for an event to bring people together, to bring communities together. Um, 
I just let's just start the slideshow here. So this is a, um, a definition of archival activism, and this is from a Queen's University website, and they've defined archival activism in two different ways. The first is using archival materials to take archives out to the community and to share stories that wouldn't otherwise be heard. And the second aspect is collecting materials from underrepresented groups um, in communities that perhaps wouldn't normally be collected in archives. So what I'm talking about is the first definition, the using archival materials to share those unheard stories. So the event we organised was this. It was a one day symposium which we held in Belleville, Ontario um, to try and bring communities together, but using archives as um, as the core of, of the event. Um, so I need to give you a bit of context to this. This is the geographical context. So we've got Deseronto is um, on the north shore of Lake Ontario, um, where that red marker is on, on this map. And I'm just going to zoom in and you'll see here's Deseronto on the on the right hand side of this map and the gray the dark gray area to the west of Deseronto is the Tayendinaga Mohawk territory now this was um, originally about three si three times the size that the territory is today so it's about 18,000 acres today but originally it was granted to the Mohawks um, in 1784 and it was a 92,000 acre stretch of land going backwards from the bay and I don't know if you can see but Deseronto kind of takes a bite out of that um, grey area that, that's the, the territory and originally Deseronto was part of the territory um, and it was granted away that little piece of land for Deseronto about 800 acres was granted away in um, 1837 And as a result of that piece of land being alienated from the territory, um, the Mohawks of the Bay of Quinty, who, who are the group that own, own that piece of land, they um, submitted a land claim to the Government of Canada. This was in um, 1995. So they did a load of historical research and they submitted a claim to the, to the Government of Canada to say, this piece of land was not surrendered properly. It should still be part of the Mohawk Territory. And the Government of Canada in 2003 agreed that this, this should be negotiated, that, that they had a good claim. So that was the situation in 2003. Um, and then not much happened. So it was, it was supposed to be being negotiated, but not a lot happened. And tensions rose in the area when there was development going on on the on the land that was under the land claim and these were the sorts of headlines that started appearing in 2007 2008 2009 there were there were demonstrations there was tension between the people who were living in Deseronto and some of the people from the territory who you know wanted to speed things up so that was the situation we had now the negotiations on the land claim happen at the government level. So they happen between the Mohawks of the Bay of Quinty, that's the building on the top left there, that's their headquarters um, on the territory. And obviously the building on the right is, represents the government of Canada. So those, those were where the negotiations were happening. Building on the bottom left is the town hall of Deseronto. So Deseronto Town Council had no part in the negotiations that were going on, but obviously was going to be affected by the result of the negotiations. So they felt a bit left out of the whole process. So consequently, they issued a, an access to information request to the government in 2007, wanting to know what the basis for the land claim was, because they were not part of the negotiations. They got sent back a lot of paper, not the actual claim itself, but all of the supporting materials, which looks a bit like this. So it's an awful lot of 18th and 19th century handwriting. Um, basically, these are photocopies of printouts from microfilm. So you can see how poor the reproductions are. Now, 
I don't know what your administrative bodies are like, but mine aren't very good at reading 18th and 19th century handwriting. Um, and they'd employed me in 2007 as the town's archivist. So they decided that perhaps I was the best person to deal with all this information. There was about a thousand pages of this stuff. Um, so this board meeting we had, the archives board in 2008, it was agreed that they would hand the papers over to me to give, um, to review them and to create a, a list. So that's what happened. They gave me some extra money to do that job. And during June, May and June 2008, I went through uh, basically this huge pile of paper and created a list. So it was it was rather strange, really, because none of those documents were held in our archives. They were held mostly at uh, Library and Archives Canada. Um, some were held at the Toronto Public Library and some were held at the Archives of Ontario. So I was basically creating a catalogue of materials held by other people. Um, and not only that, but it was the first catalogue I'd ever done for that particular archive. So, so it was very strange writing a catalogue for other people's records. Um, and also it was a very detailed catalogue because I was trying to pull out information that was relevant to the, or seemed to me to be relevant to the land claim. So this is the kind of descriptions I was doing. And sometimes there were long quotations like that third example there where there's, you know, quite a couple of quotations from the actual documents. So it's almost more of a what I would call a calendar of these of these records rather than just a basic list. Um, just as a side point, Sultan Givens, who's mentioned in these um, these records here, he's he was the missionary to the Mohawks, and he's writing to Colonel Givens. And for a long time, I thought that it was just a coincidence that they had the same name, but actually they're father and son. But they write very, very formally to each other. So you would have no idea that these two people were actually related. And sometimes they, they write quite crossly to each other as well. So it's, uh, it was quite an interesting uh, to find out that they were actually father and son. So that's the sort of information that, that I was working my way through. And I also wrote a report for the town council just with my interpretation of the documents. I mean, I'm not a, a lawyer by any means, but you know, it, I, I came up with what I thought um, was, was seemed to be the situation that these documents were describing. They're a fascinating set of documents, really um, charting the relationship between the Mohawks of the Bear Quinty and the government over 150 years. So, um, so that was my, the conclusion of the report. Um, and then I ended up in a meeting with the town solicitor about about all this as well. So it was a for me it was an interesting experience as an archivist to to be to see how these documents were be, be actually still very relevant to what's going on today. Initially, the the board didn't want to share these records online. I think they were worried about any more tensions between the the Mohawk community and the town. Um, but after a few years had passed, that had that that sort of attitude had changed, and they were willing to to share the finding aid online and on the Archeon network for Ontario. And then in 2012, we had a, another board meeting where um, Paul Robertson, who's the chair of my board, um, he's also the um, the city curator for the city of Kingston. He talked about meeting Marlene Brandt Castellano about, and they talked about using um, the documents as the basis of, of an event. Um, so we we agreed that this was a way forward. So this is Marlene. She's um, she's an incredible person. She was, she's got so much energy. She's um, she was a, the chief researcher on the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples in the 90s. Um, she's a she was a professor at, at Trent University in their, in their Native Studies department, which was the first in Canada. And um, she's also an officer of the Order of Canada. So, she, and she's she's very well respected in the Mohawk community, which is really what we needed because, you know, otherwise you feel like you might be guilty of 
cultural imperialism trying to organize an event um, that, that's all about Mohawk history, but not being a Mohawk yourself. So, um, so it was wonderful to have Marlene there um, representing that community and um, helping us to organize this event. So we knew we needed political support um, because of the tensions that we'd had in the past. So we went first to the Deseronto Town Council to present our idea for an event and they were supportive. And then I think the following month we went to the, um, the Mohawk Council and they were, there was a lot of discussion, but they were also supportive. And we went to the County Council and the Belleville City Council as well and, and all of those people were happy with the idea. So there's Paul at the um, Hastings County Council meeting presenting um, our proposal. And we also got practical support. So from the local archives in Belleville, Belleville's about, um, I don't know, 20, 30 kilometers west of, of Deseronto. That was where we were gonna hold the event. Um, we thought put it on neutral territory rather than have it in Deseronto or in um, the, the territory. So the Belleville and Hastings Community Archives were great in getting us a venue, which we didn't have to pay for. Um, the Historical Society helped us promote the event. Um, and Professor Malloy from Trent University um, was supposed to be one of the, he was supposed to chair the afternoon session. And we had a meeting with him, which really helped to shape the event. Um, unfortunately, on the day he's um, he couldn't make the event because his brother was ill, so he didn't actually, he wasn't there on the day, but he, he was great in actually helping us work out what we wanted to do. And we had a, a range of panelists and speakers who, who were willing to take part, which was, which helped to structure the day. So this was an early um, attempt at working out who we were aiming this event at and what they might be interested in hearing. So this was just sort of thinking out loud um this is just my notes about what because we had to, we had different things we thought might be good and, and we were trying to work out who would come and who might be interested in all those different aspects and the core people we wanted to bring together were, were these two sections here people from the territory and people from the town who might be you know might have been adversely affected by some of the problems that had been happening in the past so those were the core people we wanted to attract and so that was the program for the day. Um, this was our mission to try and create a safe place where people can find out more about, about the land and about the history of the land locally. Um, the program there, you see there was a, we had official welcome. So we had the, um, the chief from the territory, we had the mayor from Deseronto and the warden from the county. So we had all the you know official people turning up to welcome us, which was great. Um, Marlene did a wonderful keynote, very moving keynote about um, how she came to learn more about the, the, the history of the Mohawks long after she'd left school because they didn't get taught anything about their own history um, in, in school. And then I did some readings from the archives um, just to show the changing relationship between um, the Mohawks after the American Revolution when obviously they were allies with the with the British Crown um, and then how that sort of changed over time um, until um, the sort of early or uh, well, mid 19th century I think I went up to and then after lunch we had the uh, oh, sorry after a break we had the, the blanket exercise which I'll talk a bit more about in a minute uh, and then a panel session in the afternoon and, and um, chance for discussion which again I'll talk about bit more in a minute. So we promoted the event, we managed to get some um, newspaper coverage. Um, we, we, it was very low budget, we didn't have a budget really for this. Um, so everything was done as cheaply as possible. So we just did used a Google form for people to register. Uh, I think I ended up with my um, cell phone number on there. So I was getting phone calls at all, all hours of the day of people booking for the um, for the event. But we had about 90 people register, which we thought we were really pleased with. And it was a very low key event. Um, only one person used PowerPoint. And this is Nathan Brinklow in this picture here. And he um, he just used PowerPoint because he was speaking 
in Mohawk, and this he was giving the official opening, the, the official Haudenosaunee um, opening address. So he was he was giving the address in Mohawk, but with a an English gloss, which was in a PowerPoint presentation. So apart from um, Nathan, it was a very low tech day, which was quite frightening for me because I tend to rely on PowerPoint a lot. So it was uh, it was a, an interesting experience. So this picture shows the blanket exercise. Now I don't know if you're familiar with this, but it's um, it's it's quite a active thing as you can see everybody's up there standing on blankets on the floor and it's a, a narrative where um we're basically his, it's from the first contact of europeans and the native population and then slowly the blankets get taken away as the europeans are taking away the land and the people get taken away as as diseases wipe them out and so on and so it it's it's an active thing. There's there's lots of people talking and explaining what what's going on, and then as time goes on, you're left with just a few people who can't move around as freely as they could before, and, and you know a lot of the people have been taken out of the picture. So it's it's quite a moving um, experience for a lot of people, and it was a good centerpiece to the day because it really got people up and and moving and you know experiencing history. And then in the afternoon, we had this discussion session where you can see um, all the name tags were different colours. Now, this was a geographical dis division, so um, I'm trying to remember what the colours meant. I think red was Deseronto, um, blue was Belleville, you know, so, so basically we, we split up people according to where they lived and then told them to go and sit with people with different colour. Um, name badges to try and get the conversation going from different perspectives and that seemed to work quite well. So after the event we had a Facebook event page and a couple of people put nice comments on there and then this um, this was a report I put on our blog on the Deseron to Archives blog and this man James Pott commented and it says as you can see there the the blanket exercise left him shaken and teary eyed. So it, you can see how how it produces quite strong emotions in people. And this was a, a newspaper report on on the day as well, which was um, again quite positive. And lots of people said, "Oh, are we going to have something like this again?" So um, I think it was it was it was very successful from that point of view. This I was quite pleased with. This is the Deseronto Wikipedia page and after the event somebody added that some rapprochement was seen in October 2013 with a well-attended symposium on the land that supports our feet. Now I didn't add that so I was really pleased that somebody had thought that it was important enough to go into Wikipedia and edit the page um, and that you can see there's a little bit there about the the Culbertson tract land claim documents as well. So somebody, you know, thought that it was important enough to go into Wikipedia, which is pleasing. And we've been working more with the um, the research department of the Mohawks of the Bay of Quinty since this event, like on World War One projects. And um, I've also given this a, well a talk based on the documents to other local groups as well since then. So. Um, Things I think it has helped, and and there's been an, there's been other events as well um, on the territory. Like uh, um, there was an event in the summer about um, missing and murdered Aboriginal women, for example. So, and there seems to be more a uh, sort of a group of people coalescing around these these issues, which you know I think, uh, and a lot of those people had been at the um, at the land symposium as well. So I think it's 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 given a focus to people to learn more about what's going on in the communities that are right next door to us. So I said red was Deseronto. There, there aren't many red names on that list, and you can and that was that was an issue. We although we got about about a fifth of the people there were from the Mohawk Territory, we hardly had any people from, from Deseronto, um, which I don't know if it's just that there's a general um, what's the word I want? Fatigue about native issues. If you if you're in a in a situation where there have been tensions and they just don't want to know anymore, um, or whether it was just that 
if we'd held it in Deseronto, people would have come um, rather than having to drive to Belleville. I don't know, but it, it that was disappointing, and I don't know. If, I don't know how you can reach people who who don't want to know. Um, so, so that's something we would have to think about in the future, or maybe we should just hold the event again in Deseronto and see what happens then. So, um, this is a quotation I really like from F. Gerald Ham. I mean, if we're not helping people understand the world they live in, and if this is not what archives is all about, then I do not know know what it is we are doing that is all that important and, and I think this really sums up for me what this event was all about we're trying to help people understand why we're in the situation we're in now and if you look back and read all those documents it becomes very clear why um, why people get upset why why they're angry um, so I think that's that's vital so I think just in summary as archivists, as museum creators, I think we need we need to be able to move on, just come out of our reading rooms, come out of our museums and, and get out there into the communities. We need to make friends and allies in different sections of the community as well, so that you can reach people that you wouldn't be able to reach on your own and use those holdings that, that we have to build understanding. I've got a quotation here from um, Paulette Regan, who's the um, from the Truth and Reconciliation um, Commission in Canada um, to do with the Indian residential schools. And she says, curators and archivists at local museums can play a significant role in bringing this difficult history home, a commitment that is sometimes sparked by their own disquieting responses to these exhibits. And um, I read that book after we did this event, and I wish I'd read it beforehand because she's talking about exactly what um, we were experiencing trying to bring the communities together in this land symposium so I think that's it thank you for listening and if you've got any questions please go ahead So just replying to Jessica's question there, we got out of the out of the 90 people, I think 20 were from the Mohawk Territory. So it was um, it was a good attendance from from th that area. And I, I should say the um, after I'd given my talk, which was on, you know, I'd, I printed out all the readings on paper, the um, the chief um, our Don, Donald Maracle, he actually took my copy of my talk away with him, <laughs> so I think he enjoyed it. Next step. Um, mm, that's that's a hard question. I, I would like to hold. I would like to hold the event again or something similar, in um, in Deseronto, uh, just to to see if we can get more involvement from the local community there. Um, at the moment, I'm more focused on the First World War project that we're doing and trying to get um, maybe a, an event around that organised. So um, I should should have said I only work in Deseronto one day a week. So my time is, you know, a little limited, but, but yeah, I, I would like to do something more about this. <laughs> That's a good question, Jessica. Um, I don't think so. I don't. I can't say that I had. 
I had more people. I have had people say to me who've come into the archive say to me, oh, I, I, I was at the land symposium, but I don't know if they would have come in anyway or, or if it was because of the land symposium that they came in. So um, we, we, we're not a hugely busy archives. You know, we're, as I say, we're only open one day a week, so I maybe get two or three visitors a day. So, you know, I, I can't say that that it had a big impact in terms of um, the number of people actually visiting the archives. But that wasn't the point of it, you know, it was it was more just to raise awareness. Uh, Katie, yes, the well, actually, all of that material is available um, at the archives. It's it's somebody else's material, but we've got all the copies so they can come and see all of those papers at the archives and the catalogue the finding aid is available online so people can can read that and if it, if that isn't detailed enough for them they can come to the archives and look at our material or they can go to any of the archives that hold the originals um, and look at them there although i doubt they'll see the originals it will probably be um, microfilm uh, but but we do occasionally get people coming in to look at the copies because obviously it's easier than going to um, ottawa or toronto I think the key thing is to have those connections with the community. Um, it takes a long time to build those relationships. So if you're new in a position, I think it's difficult to do things like this. But once you've been there for a while and you've made those connections, um, and if you're, if especially if it's a reconciliation kind of um, event, like which is really, I think, what we were trying to do, it was a a local reconciliation event um, but you do need to have those connections across the different communities because otherwise it's you know it, it's you telling them what to do whereas that they need to be involved um, so I think that was having Marlene involved was absolutely essential and I don't think we could have done it without her Oh, that's a difficult question, Nan. Um, if there's an institutional reluctance. Well, we were very unsure about how this was going to go, I have to say. When, when it first came up in um, 2012, I mean, it was about 18 months in the planning this event. And some of my board were very concerned about how this was going to play out and whether there would be more um tension as a result of it or, or 
you know, and we we didn't know. Um, we really didn't know. We, we didn't know if people were going to come turn up and protest or, or what. Um, so that was one reason why we approached all the um, all the all the councils. Um, but sometimes you just have to be bold, and I think that's what we ended up deciding that nothing was going to happen unless we did something about it. So we just bit the bullet and 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 went ahead with with the um with the event but it wasn't it wasn't an, you know necessarily a, a very easy decision and i think it's just getting the right people involved who think that this can make a difference and i think it can make a difference and and it's only after you've done it that you're able to say that but um you know yeah, you have to get the right people uh, involved. I think that's all I can say, really. And if you if you've got people who are very reluctant to do that, then you know it's difficult to to achieve what you'd like to achieve. Yeah, I would agree over time, sort of gradually and, and maybe point them to events that have taken place that have been successful. <laughs> that might help. Yeah, exactly, Mark. I mean, I, I think that's how a lot of people see archives um, as somewhere you go to to look at things. But I think um, maybe I think my, my views have changed over time um, as I've got older and, and realised how important what we actually hold can be to people who have no idea what there is there and what stories they tell. So I think we have a responsibility to go out to the communities and take that information with us and share it um, because people don't necessarily even know that archives exist. So we've got to be a bit more proactive and just say, look, guys, this is really important stuff that we're holding and this affects your life today. So, yeah, I do think we should be activists. Definitely. I think it's a relatively recent discussion, Joanna, about um, being activists in archives, but more and more archives are, are doing the second thing about um, archival activism that I mentioned at the top of the presentation, you know, about collecting materials that you wouldn't normally or you wouldn't previously have collected. So making connections um, amongst different groups in the community and trying to get them represented in the archives. So I think more and more archives are doing that. Um, and some people are doing this kind of thing where you're actually, you know, going out there with the materials to, to tell people about them. So I don't think, I don't know about reluctance, but I think, I think awareness of what you can do is, is rising. Um, so I think more and more archives will be doing this kind of thing.
yeah um yes i think that's that's how i see activism is is being active not necessarily having a an agenda to push um but then i think objectivity is difficult as well as a concept i don't think anybody really can be completely objective so trying to be neutral maybe um but if you see injustice and you don't act on it, then I think that's a problem. <laughs> so, yeah, depends how you define these things. Yes, I think um, I like the idea of being open to different perspectives. I think that's what you're saying there, Mark. And and, and um, that's like, I don't know if you've come across Vern Harris's writing, but he talks about this um, hospit being hospitable, being open to different, um, diff you know, voices you don't agree with, as well as voices you do agree with, so that the, the archive is open to everybody. And, and I think that's important. Thanks for coming out, Katie. Um, thanks everybody for coming out. Um, at this time, I'm going to ask if there are any last questions. Feel free to type them in now while I'm I'm closing. Um, if there are more questions afterwards, feel free to email me, and I can forward them to Amanda. Or I'm sure you can go to the DesorantoArchives.wordpress.com, and there will be a contact for Amanda there as well. Uh, if you have any questions about webinars in general or if you have an idea for a new topic that you want to present in 2015, feel free to email me also. Amanda, thank you very much for coming out tonight and presenting on your symposium and on behalf of the Desperanto Archives. Uh, it was great having you and thanks everybody else for coming out. Thanks. Have a good night. You're welcome. Thank you.